I was first diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. At age 35, I was diagnosed with autism. And then my therapist told me that I have ADHD as well. I read a ton of these comments here on YouTube, but there is one big problem. I suppose that many of them are far from the truth. In fact, the reason for many symptoms people experience might be actually childhood trauma and wounds. To prove that, today we will define what complex trauma actually is and that most people have a completely wrong understanding of it, we will discuss if many people really use autistic masking or maybe do something else. We will find out if it's actually ADHD caused inattentiveness or another learned pattern and we will debunk many more typical autism and ADHD related symptoms. And I'm always surprised how similar all of these conditions are and question whether we need all of these different labels or not. So keep watching till the end and definitely leave me a comment under today's episode what you think about the overlap between these four. Welcome to today's episode. My name is Robert and today we talk about the huge overlap here between high sensitivity plus trauma, autism and ADHD. And before we start, I also want to remind you that you can listen to this full episode on your favorite podcast platform as well as an audio version on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you like to listen. Now, conditions like autism and ADHD definitely are really important to recognize. So if you have symptoms that could be related to these conditions, is definitely important to keep an eye on them and what's also true is that there are many many people who are still undiagnosed out there especially women with ADHD grown up women not just children and at the same time it feels like that everyone suddenly has one of these conditions that everyone suddenly is some kind of neurodivergent. And the question I had is, if this can be real, are we living in a sick society now? Are we experiencing a neurodivergent pandemic? As I did an episode on this topic before, I'll link that to you up here or in the description. And I talked about this whole topic with my therapist as well. Many people start to believe that they have one of these conditions or that believe that they are neurodivergent, that they are born with a condition like autism or ADHD. But quite often, and this is what we agreed on, it's actually a form of childhood trauma or it's a form of wounds that, are, that leave us with some kind of mental conditions. That's especially true for people who are more of the sensitive kind, for highly sensitive people, and as well for people who have neurodivergent conditions like autism or ADHD. And there is a huge overlap, this is what I can say for now, between people who are really sensitive and people who experience some form of trauma. But does that mean, on the other hand, that we are all traumatized now? Do we live in a traumatized sick society as, for example, Gabo Mate underlines? To answer that question, I want to define some of the terms first. So I talk a lot about the concept of high sensitivity here on this channel. To repeat that, give you a quick context, what actually is a highly sensitive person? Someone who is highly sensitive has a so-called sensory processing sensitivity. And this sensitivity caused an increased sensitivity of the central nervous system and a deeper cognitive processing of physical, social and emotional stimuli. When you're a highly sensitive person and you have this sensory processing sensitivity, SPS, 
That is an inner trait and what we say today, a survival mechanism, especially recognized and researched by people like Dr. Elaine and Aaron. And as we talked about the concept of HSP and autism in the previous episodes, most people with autism and probably also with ADHD probably belong to that broader spectrum of high sensitivity because what we all have in common, or however you call sensitive people, is that more sensitive perception and the more sensitive central nervous system. As well as these conditions, especially autism and ADHD, are caused by various sensitivities as well. And this is why it's explained by this huge overlap we have between high sensitivity and these conditions. We also showed um, what I came up with. Uh, I show you the graphics here. If you watch this on YouTube, you can see that now. And according to research, 15 to 20% of the population are affected and have this highly sensitive trait, which again was really helpful when we look back in human history, when you had a population, there had to be some people who had to be really sensitive, who spot dangers really quick, who react intensely to changes in the environment, and to tell the others that there is something going on to make the group more safe. Now let's talk about trauma a bit. I wanna give you an introduction here as well. And first of all, I don't really like the term trauma because it supposes or it's well connected with something really bad. So everyone talks about trauma these days. But I think trauma is such a severe term and many people would think, well, traumatized. No, I'm not traumatized. My childhood was good. My childhood was great my childhood was fine, I didn't experience any form of trauma. What most people think about when they hear the term trauma, they think about um, big car accidents, horrible things, um, terrorist attacks like 9-11, those kind of things that really uh, give a severe impact on the life situation or have a severe impact on the situation of a society uh, like those events change how we behave and how we see the world as a society, but also as an individual. And what I want to talk about is a different form, a different type of trauma. And I really like the description here of Dr. Gabo Mate. And he describes those two types of trauma as the capital T trauma, which is what I said before, huge events with severe impact, like big car accidents, like terrorist attacks, like horrible things happening, one-time events, shocking events, which really leave deep wounds within you. And then he talks about the tiny T trauma. And that is the really interesting trauma, which I want to talk about as well. Tiny T trauma is, as what he explains, not the bad things that happened, but the good things that didn't happen, that should have. So children are born with certain needs. Now it's clear to you that if I don't feed an infant, they're gonna be hurt. I'm not doing anything to them, but I'm also not giving them what they need. Human ch children and human infants Human beings also have certain emotional needs and depriving them of those needs is traumatizing. A child not getting the attention they need, the love they need, the acceptance they need, being seen, being heard, being given the freedom to experience all their emotions, whatever they happen to be. Certain other needs, if they're not met, they're also wounded. And that's what I call the small T traumas. Right, so the causes of these tiny T trauma, which in uh, psychology are defined as the term of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD, are therefore, especially for children, but also, of course, for grown-up human beings, but for children, children feel and sense 
pretty strongly when there is something going on or there is something missing. And what Gabo Marti talks about is neglecting certain needs as a child. For example, emotional needs, not getting enough attention, not giving, getting enough love, not being accepted, not being seen, not being heard, not having the freedom to experience all the emotions a child and a human being in general feels. And trauma, the term itself, comes from the Greek word for wound. And a trauma, a wound, is not the events that happen to you, not the events themselves, but it's the wound that these events caused inside you. And according to the paper Adult Survivors of Childhood Trauma, which I also link you in the description, nearly one in three people are affected. So that's a sign that we might live in a realistic society, as Gabo Mate describes in his book, The Myth of Normal, and that we definitely have to keep an eye on these things. And when I first read about all this, it was kind of, on the one hand, shocking to me, but on the other hand, it was a, a real eye-opener, because I, for the first time, I understood what was going on inside me, inside other people, and it created a lot of compassion and empathy for me. Let's talk about the signs. What signs are there that it's a sensitive nervous system affected by childhood wounds instead of autism and ADHD? Because as I said, these conditions are really similar and I'm 100% sure that there are so many people out there who believe they have one but actually have the other. There is a lot, so the overlap is huge between ASD, ADHD and CPTSD, especially, as I said, insensitive people. So I will give you now five signs, five big topics where is where the most overlap between these conditions in my experience and in experience with the sessions with my therapists I've, I had is happening. Let's start with sign number one here, and that's a really big one. It's emotional dysregulation and not meltdown and hyperfocus. I want to start with meltdown and hyperfocus in autism and ADHD, and then compare that with emotional dysregulation as a classic CPTSD symptom. The autistic meltdown. I described that in the previous episode about meltdowns, shutdowns and burnout already, is an emotional outburst out of your own control and caused by the brain being triggered. There is a sensory and social overwhelm happening that creates an, a feeling of overload within your nervous system or also underload as well, for example, by too many stimuli like bright lights, like loud noises or too quiet noises can also be the case. Usually what happens in the meltdown is that excessive demands fill out your capacity and you feel that you do not have any capacity left to cope anymore, for example, using masking strategies. And it gives you that kind of feeling that you can't ever calm down again and you might even sense a form of panic when a meltdown happens to you. A meltdown can result in shutdown and the shutdown can result in burnout. Now let's talk about the hyperfocus in ADHD. And that's especially when we look at the negative hyperfocus. Hyperfocus can also be a positive thing, it can be a kind of flow state, which really gives you a full connection and full capacity to yourself and to your system. But when negative hyperfocus happens, your system is dysregulated and you have the sense that you are getting lost in your emotions. What happens in a negative hyperfocus state is that light triggers appear where you would normally just joke about things. And these can cause intense emotional outbreaks 
and can cause dysregulated emotional states. You feel like you would fall in a kind of hole and get lost in negative thought spiral. So you overreact. Now let's compare these two things, the autistic meltdown and the hyperfocus, negative hyperfocus and ADHD with the symptom of emotional dysregulation and traumatic re-experiencing in CPTSD. As a traumatized sensitive person, you are constantly hyper aroused. You have this feeling of a high inattention, especially when you are, for example, with your partner or with friends. And at the slightest trigger, you react irritably and you have this feeling that you would lose control. You can't control yourself anymore because you are triggered by a situation which reminds you of the trauma. What also can happen in these states is that you might think about ending your life because it seems like an easy way out, an easy coping for the severe pain you're experiencing. You might even harm yourself, for example, with cutting or with beating yourself up. You might overeat or eat because it calms you down. And in those states, when you are completely dysregulated, when you might experience a flashback, some form of re-experiencing of the traumatic situation that lies in the past, you sense distress, you are full of anxiety, you have fearful feelings for no apart reason and for no obvious narrative. In a flashback, you might pull yourself back in the traumatic event. And what's important here is that re-experiencing can be misinterpreted as panic attacks or hallucinations. But what actually happens is that just this old traumatic events reappears within your current life circumstances. So you see these three autistic meltdown, hyperfocus and ADHD and emotional dysregulation and re-experiencing caused by childhood wounds, by past wounds, have a similar outcome. And that is because the central nervous system reacts in the same way. And we will, we will talk about that in the next episode about trauma, which I will upload the week after you listen to this one. Now, Let's talk about another sign here. We talk about social confusion and difficulties you would experience as someone with autism, or is it some form of learned social anxiety coming out of a wound? When you experience social confusion and difficulties because you have autistic traits, then you might struggle with social challenges like eye contact, like recognizing faces. You maybe are confused by verbal and non-verbal social cues and you may not understand or know the intentions of other people. You might also not understand what's actually going on emotionally in another person, which makes you feel uncomfortable. And the major symptom, the major emotion you might feel is some form of confusion here. It's uncomfortable to be in a social situation. It's uncomfortable to feel some form of eye contact. Now, if we compare that with learned social anxiety, you might also feel that high inner tension when you are with other people. You might feel that social contact overwhelms you because you yeah, can't really be yourself or you feel that you have to keep up with the expectations from other people. You feel overstimulated by other people, maybe by eye contact, maybe by touch, especially when you're in crowded places with many people. You might feel a sense of panic and want to withdraw. And when people look at you and try to keep eye contact, you feel exposed and uncomfortable. Again, those two social confusion and difficulties from autism are often misinterpreted by this learned 
social anxiety, which is pretty similar, but has a different cause. And the cause is, again, a wound from the past, some really bad experience you've might had, probably with your parents, with other people, with ex-partners, with caretakers who made you feel unsafe in the past experience and therefore caused this wound within you. Now let's talk about the next sign. Really, really big one in autism masking and camouflaging versus in childhood trauma caused avoidance and suppressed toxic shame and guilt. Let's talk about the masking and camouflaging first here. So masking and camouflaging, we talked about that a lot in the channel, is a survival strategy from people with autism learn to protect them. When someone is masking, he puts a filter between his true self and the outside world and wants to control how he or she appears to other people. Because someone who does that, who does autistic masking, thinks that there is a side within him or her that he or she would never show to anyone and that he or she locks in forever. There is unconscious and conscious masking. Most people on the autistic spectrum do some form of unconscious masking, so they are not aware of that. They just sense that there is something wrong with them and they, they have to lock that away because they think whatever is in there, which they lock away, is inappropriate and that they cannot let other people see what really is going on within them or that there is a specific trait, a specific emotion, a specific thing they like, something they have within them which is really important to them, but which they believe is causing other people to push them away. When you mask a lot as an autistic person, whether it's conscious or unconscious masking, you will experience some form of meltdowns and shutdowns over time because it's so exhausting and it costs so much energy to keep up the mask. So at some point you will withdraw and recharge your energy and capacity. In those situations, you will definitely avoid social contact as well because it's too energy draining. And around this whole topic of masking and camouflaging and whatever you're locking away from other people, you have a lot of shame, a lot of guilt going on, which you would never want to feel and therefore suppress especially relating to your mask. And by the while, we compare that now with CPTSD symptoms, but those bad beliefs that you have within you, that there is something that is wrong with you, that there is something that you would never show to anyone, that there's bad things going on within you, those beliefs actually come from trauma symptoms. When you have the sense of toxic shame and guilt, that's always a traumatic component within your autism. So you have this autistic masking, which you use to hide components, which are within your, let's say, trauma wound. That is what's going on here. Now let's compare this masking and camouflaging with avoidance and an affected belief system in someone with CPTSD. Most of the time, as I said, there is avoidance and an affected belief system going on in people with autism who mask certain traits or emotions and as well in people who are not autistic, who may have ADHD, who are just sensitive people, who are neurotypical people. This is going on now. When you avoid and have that affected belief system, then when things get difficult in your life, your first instinct is to shut down, to run away. And what you do now is some people procrastinate a lot, for example, with excessive playing of video games, with working, with doing sports, with eating or disruptive behaviors. And those components make it really difficult for you to keep up 
deep relationships, meaningful relationships, because you have this sense of, well, I don't need anyone. I want to be alone. So those avoidance patterns, those procrastinating patterns result in a poor sense of self because you think there is something which is not okay with me, which I experienced in the past already. I don't want to show these emotions or these needs or these traits to anyone. So you're suppressing them. And deep inside, over time, you develop that you are convinced that there is something wrong with you and you are worthless. And around this worthlessness and around all of these needs and emotions you're suppressing, you develop this constant feeling of shame and guilt. And that is, especially as I said, in people with autism, the same shame and guilt around the autistic masking. So a consequence of that is that people live a really avoidant life, which manifests especially in their relationships. So when you see someone who has on or off relationships, when you see someone who has the belief that he or she doesn't need anyone, I'm best on my own. I'm a lone wolf. I don't need anyone because relationships are exhausting or he or she on purpose avoids relationships or he or she always ends relationships because you feel that you can't really be yourself within the relationships, then you are avoiding. You have an affected belief system and most of the times this is coming out of your childhood wounds, if you believe me or not. This is part of this third sign and which makes it so difficult, especially for partners with someone who has an effective belief system or who is masking within a relationship to stick with their partner. Because your partner might always think, what is going on with you? Because he or she can't really see what you are feeling if you suppress or mask your emotions. And you, on the other hand, think, well, I can't show these emotions because then I might die or my partner will hate me. And there's so much pain, so much shame, so much guilt involved in that dynamic happening within you. But if you are traumatized or if you're an artist or someone with ADHD who is masking, it is so important to increase awareness for what you are actually doing within that dynamic in your life and to understand that and also to resolve that. All right, next sign. We compare an overly reactive nervous system within autism and ADHD, so a neurodivergent nervous system, within hypervigilance insensitive people. In people who have autism or ADHD, you often see that they feel emotional pretty quick and they're easily overwhelmed. When you are someone who has autism or to ha who has ADHD, then you might know that, that you sometimes feel really thin-skinned. You sense that there is a feeling of a high basic inner tension, which is so typical for sensitive and neurodivergent people in general, um, that you need to withdraw pretty quickly, especially within social interactions or when there is a lot going on, when you're in a city center. That's especially true in hyper-focused states in autism and ADHD, where you react especially in those states, overly sensitive and you are upset of tiny things happening to you, in those states you are easily triggered. Now, compared with hypervigilance in someone who has CPTSD, when you're hypervigilant, you never feel really safe. And this feeling of safety of high basic inner tension is coming from past experiences. So when you are with someone, when you are with your partner, with someone you are dating, with friends, with your family, you are generally alert 
and you are really careful what you say and how you behave and a part of you always says that to you, be careful and watch out. In those situations you sense that you cannot really be yourself because you somehow don't feel safe enough to be yourself and you are rarely relaxed in the presence with other people and you can't really calm down when you are with other people. When bad things happen, you're often low-key annoyed and you overread and overanalyze certain situations. For many people who are traumatized, those things up come up during the day, but especially during the night. So when you are sleeping in one bed, for example, with a friend, with your partner, in the same room, with someone, then these things might be intensified. For all of these conditions, whether you are a highly sensitive person, you are someone who experienced childhood trauma, or you're someone on the autistic spectrum, someone with ADHD, what's, what they all have in common is that they have a form of really sensitive nervous system that is easily triggered by changes in the environment and stimuli hitting the nervous system. Now let's talk about the fifth and last sign I wanna dive in now, which is inattentiveness in ADHD and withdrawal in autism versus dissociation also while re-experiencing when you have a trauma. Let's talk about inattentiveness and withdrawal first. Inattention appears as a state of dreaming in people with ADHD, and in those states, for them, it's difficult to pay attention. There is a missing ability to hold attention on relevant tasks, for example, in school and uni or at work, and people with ADHD often feel that they are on the go and they act as they are driven by a motor, they are maybe forgetful in daily activities and often avoid or dislike or is reluctant to do tasks that require mental effort over a long period of time like schoolwork or work in general. That is inattentiveness in ADHD. Withdrawal also in ADHD but especially in autism ASD is caused by over arousal and mental exhaustion, which, which can be caused in people with ADHD when they try to focus on a relevant task, but it's really difficult for them, it's really exhausting to them. And when you withdraw as someone being neurodivergent, you just wanna stay in bed, you just don't wanna to talk to anyone, you just feel exhausted, you can't motivate yourself, and you just wanna be alone. Just leave me alone. When you dissociate, being someone with CPTSD, with past wounds, then you also may appear inattentive. You appear like that you are no longer aware of the things around you. But compared to the inattentiveness in ADHD, this state is a really severe state when you experience dissociation. What happens in a dissociated state is that somehow you would leave your body and you may observe your body from the outside. You might feel like you're in a tunnel, you might feel dizzy, you might feel cold or trapped. You, you are not able to name your emotions anymore. You're just, I would say like cut off from your body. Your mind cuts itself off from the body. What happens in those situations is that when you're with your partner, when you're with someone else, who might even trigger this form of re-experiencing, this person will see you as being off or not being present at all. I do not really know, and maybe you know that if you watch this, definitely leave me a comment, if that's also true for someone who is experiencing inattentiveness as a form of or a symptom of ADHD, because I don't really know if that's really happening as well, that you feel like you're in a tunnel, that you're cut off from your body, or if it's just a form of missing focus and being inattentive. So if you know that, definitely let's discuss here. Now these two forms, again, inattentiveness 
and dissociation are also often misinterpreted as one being the other. So what we see with all of these signs and symptoms here, that there is a huge overlap and that they are super similar. Now, if you now recognize yourself in one or various of these symptoms, you might self-diagnose yourself using YouTube videos. And what I often observe here is that self-diagnosing then leads to false diagnosing. That happens because it is so difficult to clearly diagnose one or the other condition. And I also give you a reason why. Now, this is the potential and the and might be the actual overlap of these three conditions, autism, ADHD, and CPTSD. And I put plus SPS sensory processing sensitivity here because most of the people who experience some kind of past wounds and childhood trauma are really sensitive people. And I want to add that these are my own observations I've made in the past, in the research of the past hundreds of videos I did on this channel here. So there might be symptoms missing, but I think that these are the major and relevant symptoms and factors here to take into account when comparing autism, ADHD and CPTSD here. Now, can we ourselves always even clearly say if it's one or the other. No, we can't. Can a therapist say if it's one or the other? Sometimes a therapist can say that, but does it actually matter if it's clearly defined? For most of us, I don't think so at all. Now, in the end, let's talk about why that actually isn't that important if it's a clear diagnosis for autism or if it's a clear diagnosis for ADHD or if it's a clear diagnosis for CPTSD or anxiety disorder, I want to talk about solutions here. I want to talk about treatment options. And the thing is that the treatment and therapy options do not vary that much between these conditions. And that is the reason why it doesn't matter that much if you have one condition or the other. Now, let's take a look into one of my favorite papers, again, Adult Survivors of Childhood Trauma, and let's, let's have a look at the different treatment options we have for several symptoms of CPTSD here. We have hypervigilance, re-experiencing, altered attention, emotional dysregulation, and all of these symptoms have one specific treatment and that is distress regulation and the re-regulation of the central nervous system. Then we have exposure therapy for avoidance symptoms. We have to create psychological awareness of the link between symptoms and specific situations of somatic symptoms like gut pain or like digestion issues you might experience in specific situations like within a meltdown or within a traumatic re-experiencing. Then we have re-establishment of values and appropriate expectations when you have, uh, when your belief system is affected. And it doesn't matter if you are traumatized or if you are someone with autism. And I now show you why that is not that important. Because when we look at treatment for autistic symptoms, we just see that there is a 60% overlap between autism symptoms and between CPTSD. And that is also what we talked about before when I talked about masking and camouflaging, which always has a traumatic component within because when you mask and camouflage certain traits or emotions, there is always a sense of toxic shame involved, which is part of that wound or that trauma you've just experienced in the past. Same is probably also true for ADHD. Within ADHD and autism, we talk a lot about multimodal therapy. We talk a lot about concepts of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, or of applied behavior analysis, the so-called ABA, which are therapy approaches which 
involve a sense of awareness or create a sense of awareness within yourself when you have autism or ADHD that you understand why you are behaving a certain way, that you create awareness for your behavior and how it actually influences yourself and other people and therefore maybe creating better ways to behave, creating more helpful ways how to behave, more helpful ways to deal with certain situations, especially in social contact or in professional context. But the one thing that is the major factor that all of these conditions have in common, and it's also in the paper Adult Survivors of Childhood Trauma, is the dysregulated nervous system. When you have one of these conditions, you have a really sensitive nervous system, you react intensely to various stimuli, and you might experience various symptoms resulting out of that neurodivergent, highly sensitive nervous system. And this is why in the next episode, we deep dive again into the topic of high sensitivity and the role of the central nervous system, especially in trauma and in past wounds. Now, what do you think about the overlap between autism, ADHD and CPTSD? Do you also believe that it's not that important if you have a crystal clear diagnose and that it's more important to find the right treatment for your condition? Or do you believe that it is important because it helps you to understand yourself in a better way to get a clear diagnose and to have a clear explanation and label to maybe deep dive more into your specific condition to create more awareness. Definitely let me know and let's discuss under today's episode. If you want to support this podcast and channel, definitely share the episode, subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and leave me a five-star review on the audio platforms. I see and speak to you in the next episode and have a great day.